To father he is cocky, to sister he is shy. The man's a laughing stocky, well find out by and by. My cousin Connie's trinkets are safely with her spark. I've let my mother think it's a damned amusing lark. She thought he was pathetic, but now poor Kate has learned that Marlowe's quite athletic where barmaids are concerned. What an unaccountable set of beings we have got amongst. This little barmaid, though, runs in my head most strangely and drives out the absurdities of all the rest of the family. She's mine. She must be mine, or I'm greatly mistaken. Bless me, I quite forgot to tell her that I intended to prepare at the bottom of the garden. Marlowe here, and in spirits too. Give me joy, George. Crown me, shadow me with laurels. Well, George, after all, we modest fellows don't want for success among the women. <laughs> Some women, you mean. But what success has your honour's modesty been crowned with now that it grows so insolent upon us? Didn't you see the tempting, brisk, lovely little thing that runs about the house with a bunch of keys to its girdle? Well, and what then? She's mine, you rogue, you. Such fire, such motion, such eyes, such lips. But, egad, she would not let me kiss them, though. But are you sure, so very sure of her? Why, man, she talked of showing me her work above stairs. And I am to improve the pattern. But how can you, Charles, go about to rob a woman of her honour? For sure, for sure. We all know the honour of the barmaid of an inn. I don't intend to rob her. Take my word for it. There's nothing in this house I shan't honestly pay for. I believe the girl has virtue. And if she has, I should be the last man in the world that would attempt to corrupt it. You have taken care, I hope, of the casket I sent you to lock up. It's in safety. Yes, yes, it's safe enough. I have taken care of it. But how could you think the seat of a postcoach at an inn door a place of safety? Ah. Numbskull. I have taken better precautions for you than you did for yourself. I have... What? I have sent it to the landlady to keep for you. To the landlady? The landlady. You did? I did. She's to be answerable for its forthcoming, you know. Yes. She'll bring it forth with a witness. Wasn't I right? I believe you'll allow that I acted prudently upon this occasion. He must not see my uneasiness. You seem a little disconcerted, though, methinks. You sure nothing has happened? Nothing. Never was I in better spirits in all my life. So then, you left it with the landlady, who no doubt very readily undertook the charge. Rather too readily, for she not only kept the casket, but through her great precaution was going to keep the messenger too. <laughs> <laughs> They're safe, however. As a guinea in a miser's purse. So now all hopes of fortune are at an end and we must set off without it. Well, Charles, I'll leave you to your meditations on the pretty barmaid, and <laughs> may you be as successful for yourself as you have been for me. Thank you, George. I ask no more. <laughs> I no longer know my own house. It's turned all topsy-turvy. His servants have got drunk already. I'll bear it no longer. And yet, for my respect for his father, I'll be calm. Mr. Marlowe, your servant. Your very humble servant. Sir, your humble servant. What's to be the wonder now? I believe, sir, you must be sensible, sir, that no man alive ought to be more welcome than your father's son, sir. I hope you think so. I do. From my soul, sir. I don't want much entreaty. I generally make my father's son welcome wherever he goes. I believe you do, from my soul. But though I say nothing to your conduct, that of your servants is insufferable. Their manner of drinking is setting a very bad example in this house, I assure you. I protest, my very good sir, that's no fault of mine. If they don't drink as they ought, they are to blame. I ordered them not to spare the cellar. I did, I assure you. Here, let one of my servants come up. 
My positive directions were that as I did not drink much myself, they should make up for my deficiencies below. Then they had your orders for what they do. I'm satisfied. They had, I assure you. You shall hear from one of themselves. You, Jeremy, come forward, sir. What were my orders? Were you not told to drink freely and call for what you thought fit for the good of the house? I begin to lose my patience. Please, Your Honour, liberty in Fleet Street forever! Though I'm but a servant, I'm as good as another man. I'll drink for no man before supper, sir, damn me. For good liquor will sit upon a good supper, but a good supper will not sit upon... On my conscience, sir. You see, my old friend, the fellow is as drunk as he could possibly be. I don't know what you'd have more, unless you'd have the poor devil soused in a beer barrel. Zooms, he'll drive me distracted if I contain myself any longer. Mr. Marlowe, sir, I have submitted to your insolence for more than four hours, and I see no likelihood of it coming to an end. I'm resolved to be master here, sir, and I desire that you and your drunken pack may leave my house directly. Leave your house? Sure, you jest, my good friend. What, when I'm doing all I can to please you? I tell you, sir, you don't please me, so I desire you to leave my house. Sure, you cannot be serious. At this time of night? And such a night? You only mean to banter me. I tell you, sir, I am serious. And now that my passions are roused, I say this house is mine, sir. This house is mine, and I command you to leave it directly. <laughs> a puddle in a storm, I shan't stir a step, I assure you. This your house, fellow? It's my house. This is my house. Mine while I choose to stay. What right have you to bid me leave this house, sir? I never met with such impudence. Curse me, never in my whole life before. Nor I, confound me if ever I did, to come to my house, to call for what he likes, to turn me out of my own chair, to insult my family, to order his servants to get drunk, and then tell me this house is mine, sir. By all that's impudent, it makes me laugh. Ha! 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 Pray, sir, as you take the house, what think you of taking the rest of the furniture? There's a pair of silver candlesticks, and there's a fire screen, and here's a pair of brazen nosed bellows. Perhaps you take a fancy to them! Bring me your bill, sir. Bring me your bill, and let's make no more words about it. Oh, and there's a set of prints, too. What think you of Rake's progress for your own apartment? Bring me your bill, I say, and I'll leave you in your infernal house directly. Then there's a mahogany table that you may see your own face My in. My bill, I say. Oh, I had forgot the great chair for your own particular slumbers after a hearty meal. Zooms, bring me my bill, I say, and let's hear no more aunt. Young man. Young man. From your father's letter to me, I was taught to expect a well-bred, modest man as a visitor here. But now I find him no better than a coxcomb and a bully. But he will be here presently, and shall hear more of it. How's this? Sure, I've not mistaken the house. Everything looks like an inn. The servants cry coming, the attendance is awkward, the barmaid, too, to attend us. But she's here and will further inform me. With us so fast, child, a word with you. Let me show it then. I'm in a hurry. I believe he begins to find out his mistake, but it's too soon quite to undeceive him. Pray, child, answer me one question. What are you? And what may your business in this house be? A relation of the family, sir. What? A poor relation? Yes, sir. A poor relation appointed to keep the keys and see that the guests want nothing in my power to give them. That is, you act as the barmaid of this inn. Inn? Oh, law. What brought that into your head? One of the best families in the county keep an inn. Old Mr Hardcastle's house, an inn. Mr. Hardcastle's house. Is this house 
Mr Hardcastle's house child? Aye, sure. Whose house should it be? So then, all's out. And I have been damnably imposed on. Oh, confound my stupid head! I shall be laughed at over the whole town. I shall be stuck up in caricature in all the print shops. The Dullissimo Macaroni! To mistake this house of all others for an inn? And my father's old friend for an innkeeper? What a swaggering puppy must he take me for? What a silly puppy do I find myself? There again. May I be hanged, my dear, but I mistook you for the barmaid. Dear me! Dear me, I'm sure there's nothing in my behaviour to put me on a level with one of that stamp. Nothing, my dear, nothing. But I was in for a list of blunders and could not help making you a subscriber. My stupidity saw everything the wrong way. I mistook your assiduity for assurance, your simplicity for allurement. But it's over. This house I no more show my face in. I hope, sir. I've done nothing to disoblige you. I'm sure I should be sorry to affront any gentleman who's been so polite and said so many civil things to me. I'm sure I should be sorry <laughs> if he left the family upon my account. I'm sure I should be sorry people said anything amiss since I have no fortune but my character. By heaven, she weeps. This is the first mark of tenderness I ever had from a modest woman. And it touches. Excuse me, my lovely girl. You are the only part of the family I leave with reluctance. But to be plain with you, the difference of our birth, fortune and education makes an honourable connection impossible. And I can never harbour a thought of seducing simplicity that trusted in my honour or bringing ruin upon one whose only fault was being too lovely. Generous man. I now begin to admire him. But I'm sure my family is as good as Miss Hardcastle's. And though I'm poor, that's no great misfortune to a contented mind. And until this moment, I never thought it was bad to want fortune. And why now, my pretty simplicity? Because it puts me at a distance from one that if I had a thousand pound, I would give it all to. This simplicity bewitches me, so that if I stay, I'm undone. I must make one bold effort and leave her. Your partiality in my favour, my dear, touches me most sensibly. And were I to live for myself alone, I could easily fix my choice. But I owe too much to the opinion of the world, too much to the authority of a father, so that... I can scarcely speak it. It affects me. Farewell. knew half his merit till now. He shall not go if I have power or art to detain him. I'll still preserve the character in which I stooped to conquer, but will undeceive my papa, who perhaps may laugh him out of his resolution. Oi, right, you may steal for yourselves the next time. I've done my duty. She's got the jewels again. That's a sure thing. But she believes it was all a mistake of the servants. But my dear cousin, sure you won't forsake us in this distress. If she in the least suspects that I am going off, I shall certainly be locked up or sent to my aunt Pedigrees, which is ten times worse. Aye, to be sure. Aunts of all kinds are damn bad things. But what can I do? Oh, you've got you a pair of horses that will fly like Whistlejacket. And I'm sure you can't say, but I have caught you nicely before her face. Here she comes. We must court a bit or two more for fear she should suspect us. I was greatly fluttered, to be sure. But my son tells me it was all a mistake of the servants. 
I shan't be easy, however, until they are fairly married. And then let her keep her own fortune. But what do I see? Fondling together as I'm alive. I never saw Tony so sprightly before. Pretty doves. <laughs> what? Billing, exchanging stolen glances and broken murmurs there? Eh? <laughs> As for murmurs, Mother, we may grumble a little now and then, to be sure, but there's no love lost between us. And they're sprinkling, Tony, upon the flame, only to make it burn brighter. Cousin Tony promises to give us more of his company at home. Mm. Indeed, he shan't leave us any more. <laughs> It won't leave us, Cousin Tony, will it? <laughs> oh, it's a pretty creature. No, I'd sooner leave my horse in a pound than leave you when you smile upon one so. <sighs> Your laugh makes you so becoming. Agreeable cousin. <laughs> Who can help admiring that natural humour, that pleasant, broad, red, thoughtless, Ah, uh, it's a full piece. <laughs> Pretty innocence. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sure I've always loved Cousin Con's hazel eyes and those long, pretty fingers which she twists this way <laughs> and that way as she plays the haspicles like a parcel of bobbins. Oh, he would charm the bird from the tree. I was never so happy before. My boy takes after his father, poor Mr Lumpkin, exactly. The jewels, my dear Khan, shall be yours incontinently. You shall have them. Isn't he a sweet boy, my mm. dear? You shall be married tomorrow. And we'll put off the rest of his education, like Dr Drowse's sermons, to a fitter opportunity. Where's the squire? I've got a letter for your worship. Give it to my mamma. She reads all my letters first. I had orders to deliver it into your own hands. Who does it come from? Well, your worship and ask that of the letter itself. Well, I could wish to know, though. Undone, undone. A letter to him from Hastings. I know the hand. If my aunt sees it, we are ruined forever. I'll keep her employed a little if I can. But I have not told you, madam, of my cousin's smart answer just now to Mr Marlowe. Oh, we so laughed. <laughs> well, this way a little, for he must not hear us. <laughs> a damned cramped piece of penmanship as ever I saw in my life. I can read your print hand very well, but here there are such handles and shanks and dashes one can scarce tell the head from the tail. To Anthony Lumpkin, Esquire. Very odd. I can read the outside of my letters when my own name is well enough, but... When I come to open it, it's all buzz. That's hard, very hard. For the inside of the letter's often the cream of the correspondence. <laughs> very well, very well. <laughs> so, my boy was too hard for the philosopher. Yes, madam. <laughs> but you must hear the rest, madam. A little more this mm -hmm. way, or he may hear us. You'll hear how he puzzled him again. He looks strangely puzzled himself, methinks. <laughs> A damned up and down hand, as if it was disguised in liquor. Dear Squire. Aye, that's that, but then there's an M and a T and an S. Whether the next be an Izzard or an R, confound me, I cannot tell. <laughs> What's that, my dear? Could I give you any assistance? Oh, pray, Aunt, let me read it. <clears throat> Nobody reads a cramped hand better than I. Do you know who it is from? Can't tell, except from Dick Ginger the feeder. So it is. <clears throat> Dear Squire, hoping that you're in health as I am at this present, the gentleman of the Shake Bag Club has cut the gentleman of Goose Green quite out of feather. The odds... Um, odd battle... Long fighting... Oh... <laughs> Here, yeah, yeah, it's all about cocks and fighting. It's of no consequence. Here, put it up. Put it up. I tell you, miss, it's of all the consequence in the world. I'd not lose the rest of it for a guinea. Here, mother, can you make this out? Of no consequence. As this. 
dear Squire, I am now waiting for Miss Neville with a post chaise and pair at the bottom of the garden. But I find my horses yet unable to perform the journey. I expect you'll assist us with a pair of fresh horses as you promised. Dispatch is necessary as the hag uh, the hag, your mother, will otherwise suspect us. Yours, Hastings. Patience, I shall run this tragic. My rage chokes me. I hope, madam, you'll suspend your resentment for a few moments and not impute to me any impertinence or sinister design that may belong to another. Fain spoken, madam. You are most miraculously polite and engaging and quite the very pink of courtesy and circumspection, madam. And you, you great ill-fashioned oaf, we scarce sense enough to keep your mouth shut. Well, you too joined against me. But I'll defeat all your plots in a moment. As for you, madam, since you've got a pair of fresh horses ready, it won't be cruel to disappoint them. So, if you please, instead of running away with your spark, Prepare this very moment to run off with me. Your old aunt pedigree will keep you secure. I'll warrant me. And you too, sir, may mount your horse and guard us upon the way. Here, Thomas, Roger, Diggory, I'll show you. I wish you better than you do yourselves. So now I'm completely ruined. Aye, that's a sure thing. What better could be expected from being connected with such a stupid fool? And after all the nods and signs I made him? By the laws, miss, it was your own cleverness, not my stupidity, that did your business. You were so nice and busy with your shake bags and goose grease that I thought you could never be making believe. So, sir, I find by a servant that you have shown my letter and betrayed us. Was this well done, young gentleman? Here's another. Ask Miss there who betrayed you. We caught it was her doing, not mine. So, I have been finely used here among you. Rendered contemptible, driven into ill manners, despised, insulted, laughed at. Here's another. We shall have old Bedlam broke loose presently. And there, sir, is the gentleman to whom we all owe every obligation. What can I say to him? A mere boy. An idiot, whose ignorance and age are a protection. A poor, contemptible booby that would but disgrace correction. Yet with cunning and malice enough to make himself merry with all our embarrassment. An insensible cub, replete with tricks and mischief. Oh, dummy. I'll fight you both one after the other. We're baskets. As for him, he's below resentment. But your conduct Mr. Hastings requires an explanation. You knew of my mistakes, yet would not undeceive me. Tortured as I am with my own disappointments, is this a time for explanations? It is not friendly, Mr. Marlowe. Sir! Mr. Marlowe, we never kept on your mistake till it was too late to undeceive you. Be pacified. My mistress desires you get ready immediately, madam. The horses are put to. Your hat and things is in the next room. We ought to go 30 miles before morning. Well, well, I'll come presently. Was it well done, sir, to assist in rendering me ridiculous? To hang me out for the scorn of all my acquaintance? Depend upon it, sir, I shall expect an explanation. Was it well done, sir, if you are upon that subject, to deliver what I entrusted to yourself to the care of another, sir? Mr. Hastings. Mr. Marlowe, why will you increase my distress by this groundless dispute? I implore, I entreat. Your cloak, madam. 
My mistress is impatient. I come, pray be pacified. If I leave you thus, I shall die with apprehension. Your fan, muff and gloves, madam. The horses are waiting. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, if you knew what a scene of constraint and ill nature lies before me, I'm sure it would convert your resentment into pity. I am so distracted with a variety of passions that I don't know what I do. Forgive me, madam. George, forgive me. You the know my hasty temper and should not exasperate it. The torture of my situation is my only excuse. My dear Hastings, if you have that esteem for me that I think, that I'm sure you have, your constancy for three years will but increase the happiness of our future connection. If- Miss Neville, Constance, wait Constance- I'm coming! Constancy. Remember, constancy is the word. <laughs> My heart. How can I support this? To be so near happiness and such happiness. You see now, young gentleman, the effects of your folly. What might be amusement to you is here disappointment and even distress. Econ, I have hit it. It's here. Give me your hands, yours, and yours, my poor sulky. My boots, ho! Oh! Meet me two hours hence at the bottom of the garden, and if you don't find Tony Lumpkin a more good-natured fellow than you thought for, I'll give you leave to take my best horse and bet bouncer into the bargain. My boots, ho! Oh! You saw the old lady and Miss Neville drive off, you see? Yes, Your Honour. They went off in a postcoach. Young Squire went on horseback. They're 30 miles off by this time. And all my hopes are over. Yes, sir. Old Sir Charles has arrived. He and the old gentleman of the house have been laughing at Mr. Marlowe's mistake this half hour. They're coming this way. Then I must not be seen. So now to my fruitless appointment at the bottom of the garden. This is about the time. <laughs> tone in which he sent forth his sublime commands. <laughs> and the reserve with which I suppose he treated all your advances. And yet he might have seen something in me above a common innkeeper too. Yes, yeah, Dick, but he mistook you for an uncommon innkeeper. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, two good spirits to think of anything but joy. Yes, my dear friend, this union of our family will make our personal friendships Hereditary.